this is the biggest CPU test on our channel. Six popular Ryzen CPUs, three generations of Zen, and two cheap A chipset motherboards. Today we will answer a lot of questions. Can quad-core processors still run games, or are 6 cores a prerequisite now? Is the Ryzen 3000 series still relevant? Which is more important, a lot of cache volume or fast work with RAM? Is it a good idea to save a buck on the motherboard? And finally, we will choose the best value processor, both for games and for productivity tasks. This is MK here. Testing the most affordable Ryzen processors. Let's go. Here they are, our six test subjects. The first is a 4-core Ryzen 3 3100 on Zen 2. AMD still considers this 5-year-old architecture relevant, and the lower-tier Ryzen 7000U mobile CPUs are still based on it. We have already shown by the example of the 4-core Ryzen 5 1500X that even such processors, based on the first generation of the Zen architecture, are still capable. But today, they're quite at the Xeon level. Cheap and got no future. So let's go up a notch. The Ryzen 5 3600 and 4500. 6 Zen 2 cores at 4 GHz. These chips are similar, but only in appearance. The 3600 is a chiplet design processor with 32 MB of L3 cache, which works with RAM rather slowly due to its structure. But the 4500 is actually the 4600G, only with iGPU disabled. It has a monolithic die and therefore works great with fast RAM but its cache is undercut a little, only 8 MB L3. Which is better, an extra 24 MB of cache or fast memory? Let's check it out. The Ryzen 5000 lineup doesn't have 4-core CPUs, so our contestants are the 6-core Ryzen 5 5500 and 5600, both based on the Zen 3 architecture. The first processor is actually the 5600G with iGPU disabled. Again, a monolithic die and fast work with RAM, but only 16 MB of cache. The 5600 has a chiplet design and 32 MB of cache, but it is slower when interacting with RAM. And the cherry on the cake is the freshest 6-core Ryzen 5 7500F. The frequency is up to 5 GHz. The new Zen 4 architecture, support for high-frequency DDR5, we got a clear winner here. But how much value is there in terms of cost of performance? Taking into account the more expensive memory and motherboard. Let's do the math. If it seems difficult, please pause the video now. We have made a complete table with all the main specs of the subjects. We will test our six processors on the cheapest boards that we could find, by a well-known manufacturer. The AIM4 board is the Gigabyte A520S2H. There are only 4 CPU VRMs, 2 RAM slots, a handful of ports, and no reinforcement. But the price is only $55. The M5 board is completely identical, but 2 times more expensive. The Gigabyte A620S2H. It is literally a copy of the 520. They simply added 2 more VRMs and replaced the RAM slots to DDR5. The cooling system is also the simplest, the Gamex AG300 tower cooler with three thermal tubes. It's definitely an overkill for a 4-core CPU, but let's see if it can handle the hot-tempered 6 cores of different generations. Let's start the test with the 8064 memory benchmark. All of our AIM4 Ryzen, even though paired with an inexpensive board, were able to reach the frequency of 3200 MHz. So spending more on the motherboard in order to be able to overclock RAM is unnecessary. The chiplet processors can be distinguished right away. Because of just one die with cores, their RAM write speed drops by half. The monolithic Ryzen CPUs obtained from single die APUs by disabling graphics have no such problems. Overall, at the frequency of 3200 MHz, both Zen 2 and Zen 3 work almost identically. The improved RAM controller in the Ryzen 5000 only slightly reduced access latency. The 7500F is far ahead, even with the not-so-fast DDR5-6000, but it also suffers from having only one chiplet with cores. But how much does the slow work with RAM affect productivity tasks? Let's start with CPU-Z. This benchmark is a good number cruncher. Such calculations are easily parallel for any number of cores, they do not require a large cache volume and the processor preloads data from RAM into it. Therefore, the result is quite precise. The 4-core Ryzen 3100 is clearly an outsider. The 6-core Zen 2 CPUs are exactly 1.5 times faster. 
the difference between monolithic and chiplet processors from the same architecture is within the margin of error. Neither fast RAM nor a large cache volume are absolutely important in such calculations. Clock speed and architecture come out on top. And since all of our AM4 subjects have a frequency of about 4 GHz, a 20% increase in Zen 3 relative to Zen 2 is visible. The 7500F is expectedly ahead by the same 20%. Here the increase is also due to a higher clock speed of 5 GHz. In 7-zip, the situation gets more interesting. This archiving utility operates large amounts of data, which makes the size of the L3 cache important. As a result, the 4-core Ryzen 3100 is again at least 1.5 times behind the rest, and the difference of about 7-10% to between monolithic and chiplet processors with the same generation of Zen core becomes visible. But still, the architecture comes to the fore. The newer Zen 3 allows the Ryzen 5500 with 16 MB L3 to get ahead by 12% relative to the Ryzen 3600 with 32 MB of cache and the older Zen 2. The 7500F is again ahead by 20%, thanks to Zen 4 and the 5 GHz. In Adobe Premiere, the situation is similar. Video processing, even with the help of a powerful RTX 3080 Ti, strongly depends on the cache volume of the processor. As a result, a 2-minute 4K video on the Ryzen 3600 took only 4% longer to render than on the Ryzen 5500. The lack of 16 MB of cache killed the difference between Zen 2 and 3. And between the architecturally identical 5500 and 5600, the difference is only 11%, comparable to an increase per generation. At least the results of the Ryzen 3100 and 7500F are consistent. The first one is at least a quarter slower than any 6-core CPU, and the newer AM5 CPU goes off by 20-25% to relative to its predecessors. There is also a third type of benchmarks that need fast work with RAM. These include Ycruncher, which calculates millions of digits after decimal point of pi. On the one hand, this task is predictable and easy to parallel, but on the other hand, it is extremely demanding on the amount and speed of memory. To calculate 2.5 million digits of pi, as much as 10 GB of RAM is required. Therefore, it is not surprising that the monolithic Ryzen 5500 with faster memory surpassed the chiplet 5600 by 5% 5 in this test. There is less difference between the Ryzen 3600 and 4500, about 2%, so the cache volume for Y Cruncher is also important, but fast RAM is the most important. This is demonstrated by the 7500F which, thanks to DDR5, is 80% ahead of its predecessors. But for rendering images as well as in CPU-Z, fast RAM or a large cache do not make any difference. In Cinebench R23, the results of the 6-core CPUs with the same architecture differ marginally. The number of cores, frequency, and Zen generation come out on top again. The Ryzen 3100 is an outsider as usual. Its result is 25% lower than the modern 4-core Core, Core i3-12100. The Ryzen 3600 and 4500 feel much better. Although Zen 2 architecture is far from being new, the 4-core older lake is easily outperformed by the 6-core oldies. The Zen 3 architecture gives about 15% more boost. It's still not at the level of the i5-12400, but its predecessor, the i5-11400 Rocket Lake, is well behind. The 7500F is 30% ahead here, which allows it to perform at the level of an 8-core Ryzen 5000. On top of that, we will run a half-hour Cinebench test, which is great for testing heating and consumption. This is the only time that the Ryzen 3100 has the best result of all. It's the only one which fits into the official 65 watts TDP limit, consuming an average of about 55 watts. The Ryzen 3600 surprised in a bad way. Without limits, it consumes as much as 90 watts, which is comparable to the 7500F. Apparently, we lost the silicon lottery, since the rest of the AM4 6-core CPUs were staying in a bunch, consuming about 70 to 80 watts. But in any case, it's still far from overheating. An inexpensive tower with three heat pipes is able to keep all the test subjects within a reasonable 80 degrees. The same cannot be said about the motherboards, and they were having a hard time here especially the A520. Of course, nobody expected low temperatures of the VRM on a cheap motherboard, but 125 degrees at peak is not just a lot, it's critical. That said, these boards don't even thermal throttle. It seems they're just trying to die as soon as possible so that they don't get tortured anymore. In productivity tasks, such a board can only handle a 4-core Ryzen 3100. 
but even here, the temperature of the power zone reaches 90 degrees. The situation is even worse for the A620. The 7500F is the simplest processor on the AM5, and even with it, the heating of the MOSFETs reaches 105 degrees. It turns out that such a board is not viable at all without undervolting or heat sinks, in case you need it for productivity tasks. We will summarize the results in such tasks at the end of the video, so let's move on to the games. To begin with, 3DMark times Pi, which among other things is able to measure the performance of processors in games. The results are interesting. The developers of 3DMark believe that the cache and RAM do not affect the gameplay at all, so the 6-core CPUs showed the same performance within the same architecture. As for the architecture, the difference between Zen 2 and Zen 3 is small here, about 10%. The only ones that stand out are the Ryzen 3100 and 7500F, with the latter outperforming the 5000 series by 20%. But what will happen in games? In order not to get bottlenecked by the video card, we used an RTX 3080 Ti. After all, the Ryzen 7500 is a very fast processor. All games were tested in Full HD at maximum graphics settings for the highest CPU load, with the video card loaded only slightly thanks to upscaling in performance mode. The first will be Cyberpunk 2077 with Ultra Ray Tracing, which is already a well-deserved benchmark for gaming systems. The 4-core Ryzen 3100 holds up well, but only in the built-in test, producing an average of 52 FPS. When driving around the city and shooting, the average FPS can fall below 40. It is of course playable, but it's quite on the border. For a better experience, you'll need to reduce processor-dependent settings. The 6-core Ryzen 3600 and 4500 on Zen 2 are doing better. They are both capable of outputting 60 FPS according to the test, but still the lack of L3 cache volume is noticeable. The chiplet design Ryzen is 10% faster. When driving around the city, the situation is similar. If the monolithic Ryzen 4500 can go below 40 FPS, the 3600 with 32MB of cache does not allow this to happen. The Ryzen 5500 and 5600 have a similar pattern. The chiplet processor is 10% faster. In addition, the Zen 3 architecture provides an excellent boost, which translates into a 10% increase in frame rate. When driving around the city, the Ryzen 5000 series feel absolutely comfortable, seldom dropping below 50 FPS. On average, you will almost always have over 60 FPS. But all of them fall behind the fresh Ryzen 5 7500F. The new architecture, coupled with a frequency of up to 5 GHz, allows it to output above 100 FPS according to the benchmark. An increase relative to the 5600 is 25%. When driving around the city, the situation is similar. For a 6-core Zen 4 CPU, even the 1% low FPS is often greater than the average FPS of its predecessors. Let's move on, Far Cry 6 is next in line. The game is not particularly demanding, but it has a feature inherent in many projects from the last decade. There is a one-core bottleneck. Theoretically, this should increase the impact of RAM on performance, but in practice, once again, a large L3 cache plays a key role. That said, it's so important in fact that the 4-core Ryzen 3100 with 16 megabytes of cache turned out to be on par with the 6-core 4500, which has its L3 half the size. Also, being locked into only one thread reveals a tangible difference between Zen 3 and 2, about 15%. For the same reason, the transition to the 5 GHz Ryzen 7500 F gives a good boost. It is almost 20% faster than the 5600. But in general, the game is not demanding, so you can get almost stable 60 FPS even on the old 4-core Ryzen 3100. And finally, The Last of Us PC port. The game is extremely demanding on the processor, so the 4-core Ryzen 3100 is almost always loaded at 100%, and the frame rate is around 40 to 50. Taking into account that this game was primarily designed for consoles, it's okay, but you might want to consider tweaking the settings a little. It is clearly noticeable that the game prefers cores to the cache, so the 6-core 4500 is at least 20% faster than the 4-core processor, providing a stable 60 FPS. The extra 24 MB of L3 allows the Ryzen 3600 to win back about 10% from its monolithic counterpart, but the more recent Ryzen CPUs on Zen 3 outperform their predecessors by an average of 20%, producing up to 80 FPS. The leader, of course, is the Ryzen 7500F. It is so good that it was almost able to bottleneck into the 3080 Ti in Full HD, and even with DLSS at performance. 
the increase relative to the 5600 is almost one and a half times. 120 to 130 FPS will be definitely appreciated by the fans of fast refresh rate panels. Now let's put everything together and summarize. Let's start with productivity tasks where it's clear that nothing is clear. We can say for sure that it's time for 4-core CPUs to retire. Most of the modern software will easily load a couple dozen threads with work, so the Ryzen 3100 lags behind its counterparts by at least 40%. But in the confrontation between the cache and faster RAM, there is no clear winner. In some cases, chiplet processors are faster, in others, monolithic. On average, we can say that the architecture still makes the greatest contribution. The transition from Zen 2 to Zen 3 can speed up workflows up to 20%. The difference within the same version of Zen in the 6-core processors does not exceed 5-7%, to which is the margin of error. Of course, the winner was the 7500F, Zen 4 at 5GHz, which allows it to outperform the quad-core Ryzen by more than double and dominate by 40-50% to over the 6-core Ryzen of previous generations. But how much value is there in terms of price to performance? Let's take the Ryzen 3100 as a reference again, which you can find for about $55. Relative to it, the Ryzen 5 5500 has the most value for productivity tasks. It costs only about $15 more, but at the same time offers 40% better performance. Both of our 6 core Zen 2 CPUs tested turned out to have less value. Yes, their cost is comparable or slightly cheaper than the 5500, but due to the older architecture, they lose performance per dollar, turning out to be on average only 25% better than the 4 core Ryzen 3100. But the 5600 and 7500F are the obvious outsiders. The first one costs $30 more than the Ryzen 5500, offering only 4% performance increase in productivity tasks. Therefore, in terms of cost to performance, it turns out to be even slightly worse than the 4-core Ryzen 3100. The fresh 7500F is even worse. It can be found for about 150 US dollars, that is, it is almost twice as expensive as the Ryzen 5500, but it is only 40% faster. As a result, the performance per dollar is 13% lower than that of the old Ryzen 3100. And if you remember that AM5 boards are more expensive than AM4 and DDR5 is not getting much cheaper, the value of processors for the newer platform is still a big question. And the last conclusion from the productivity tests is that the cheapest A520 boards leave much to be desired in terms of VRM. They're not even able to handle 6-core CPUs. Their real limit is 4 cores. The A620 is more complicated. The Gigabyte S2H has problems even when working with a simple Ryzen 5 7500F, and it is as bad as it can get. But some time ago, we tested another A620 board by MSI, and it did show a good result when working with a 6-core CPU. Therefore, when choosing a board, you first need to look for tests measuring the heating of the VRM. Otherwise, you risk not to just deprive yourself of an upgrade, but also to get a dangerously hot config right out of the box. Let's move on to the games. Except for the Time Spy benchmark, which shows the weather on Mars apparently, all games clearly show an advantage of the chiplet design Ryzen processors with a large amount of L3 cache, the increase from which can sometimes be compared with a couple of additional cores. The monolithic 4500 and 5500 feel on average 10% worse than their more cachey counterparts, but in general, all the 6-core Ryzens on Zen 2 and 3 can provide comfortable gameplay even in very demanding games. The Ryzen 3100 performs somewhere at the Xeon level. It can run everything, even at Ultra, but it still needs some tweaking here and there if you're seeking very smooth gameplay. The 7500F is again the leader, but the difference with the Zen 3 solutions is less than that in performance tasks. After all, games are less predictable and hard to parallel. However, this is the only processor in today's test with which you can really think about buying a fast monitor. It is able to output above 100 FPS almost everywhere, even at Ultra. But if you add its price to the equation, then the situation becomes similar to how it is in performance tasks. Both 6-core Zen 2 processors have only 10% more value than their 4-core counterpart. Although the Ryzen 5600 is 10% faster than the 5500, it cannot compensate for the difference of a third in its price. So in terms of cost to performance, the 5600 turns out to be 12% worse than the reference 3100. But the 5500 is back in the lead. It has 30% more value than the 4-core counterpart. 
with the 7500F, there are no surprises. In absolute terms, it is really fast, but the high price spoils everything. Even the old 3100 turns out to have more value for games by as much as 26%. As a result, the Ryzen 5500 deservedly has the most value on AM4. And not only on AM4. We have already tested it together with the low-cost i3-12100 on the LGA1700 in the harshest conditions with background tasks. The Ryzen 5500 was also a winner here. It lags behind its higher-tier brother in productivity tasks only a little, and the loss of 10% FPS is hardly critical, especially if you remember the price of the Ryzen 5600. But there is an important caveat. Since this processor is actually a 5600G with a disabled iGPU, it inherited 16 PCIe 3.0 lanes from it. While this will not cause any problems with old or fast cards, such cards as the RTX 4060 and RX 7600 only have 8 lanes, and the transition from PCIe 4.0 to 3.0 can significantly reduce their performance in conditions of lack of video memory, which is not uncommon for 8GB cards even in Full HD. In this case, it's worth considering buying a Ryzen 5 3600. It costs the same on average, is 10% slower in games, but it offers full-fledged 16 PCIe 4.0 lanes and will handle an RTX 4060 level card without issues. The outsiders are the Ryzen 3 3100 and Ryzen 5 4500. We only got one question about the former. Why is it 50 plus dollars, which is only about 10 to 15 dollars cheaper than the much faster 6-core Ryzen? The only advantage of this CPU is that it's cool and undemanding. Even at default settings, the cheapest A520 board can handle it without problems. Its real price should be around $35 or so, then it could be called a good option. The Ryzen 5 4500 is not much better. 8MB of L3 cache along with 16 PCIe 3.0 lanes look like a bad joke. It is 20-25% faster than the Ryzen 3100 in games with a 1.5 fold advantage in cores. While with the newer cards, the difference, due to the old version of the PCIe bus, will be even smaller. An adequate price for this CPU is $45 to $55. In this case, it can be called a good CPU for productivity tasks, where a small cache volume has little effect on performance. You can't imagine how happy I am to finally be recording the ending to this video. More than a week of testing, lots of analysis, let's sum it up. We call the Ryzen 5 5500 the best processor, low budget. This is applicable if you are considering a video card with PCIe X16. If you've got something newer, like the 7600 or the 4060, take a closer look to the 3600. It's still a good one. About motherboards and trying to save a buck, these two motherboards by Gigabyte are good for nothing. They are bad motherboards. You have seen the VRM heating. It's totally awful. The MSI board we tested didn't have this. So saying hello to Gigabyte. This was MK, my name is Mikhail Krushin. I'll see you soon. Stay safe. Bye.